Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the SMC Journal Show. This is the show where we talk about everything involving today's modern IT and the tech space. I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thank you for joining me. In this video, I'm going to tell you about five main reasons that I see load testing does not work in organizations. Many of you know me as a performance engineer, and I've got over 30 years of experience. And I'm, I'm asked quite commonly, Scott, what are the things that you see that go wrong when companies try to start doing performance engineering and load testing, but it doesn't work out the way they had hoped? Is there anything that you can tell us of how we can avoid those things? And I'm happy to tell you there are. So in today's video, that's what we're going to talk about. Five big reasons why load testing just doesn't work. Are there more than five? Of course there are. But these are the ones that I have found to be the most common they're vendor neutral and they're tool neutral, although tools have a role in this to play. So with that, let's get started and we're going to do a countdown from five to one. And first, let's talk about number five, wrong roles and wrong skills. This happens quite frequently in organizations whenever they're first starting out. Maybe they were just sold a commercial product or it came with a package or they've had a performance issue for the very first time that's really hit them hard. And now it's important to be doing performance testing on their web applications, or maybe they need to do load testing to make sure they can scale. But the issue has come up. QA manager, upper manager, someone will come downstairs and say, hey, you're a QA person. You know how to do testing. You should be doing the load testing. Or you're an automation person for us. You do the functional automation with our tool set. You should be doing load testing. Or, hey, you're a BA or a PM, and you have to focus on the end user and their experience. So you should want to know, you know what performance is. You should be in involved with load testing. You're a developer. So obviously, if you know how to write code, you should automatically know everything there is to know about performance testing and load testing and engineering and all that stuff. So just, just do it. And that can be a recipe for disaster. Why? As much as some tool makers and their marketing departments would like to, you to believe that just anybody can do load testing, anybody can be a performance engineer, it's not true. It cannot become a commodity because there's too much involved in performance engineering. And load testing is one piece of performance engineering. You'll hear me, hear me use those terms back and forth. Load testing is a smaller subset of performance engineering as a whole, but it's a very important piece of it. And part of that is understanding, for example, your company's technology stack, the things that make up your applications, the back end, the infrastructure, the database, the front end, all the code, the network, the cloud that you're on. All of those things are pieces of a bigger puzzle. And a performance engineer will understand that entire stack. Now, I'm not talking about they'll know every line of code. They'll know every single packet. I'm saying that they will understand how performance is affected by all of these various layers. And they'll be able to see the forest and not just the trees. Whereas a developer is mostly uh, thinking about the functionality that they're creating. And does that function perform well? Or does it, if they're shifting left even, they're only probably running a few users or maybe 50 users at a time to scale at very low levels just to make sure this sort of a sanity check that their, their performance is not suffering too much. Now, that would be a great case, but you still end up needing somebody with those special skill sets to understand performance as a whole, because even though the code may be fast, the database may be fast, and even the network might be fast. If the end user experience is slow, it's going to take someone with those special skill sets to figure out end to end what the problem is. So it's very important for you to have the right people do it with the right skill sets doing this job. Number four is bad environments. Oh boy, this is a big one. And it's probably the bane of many performance engineers' existence, especially when they're trying to tell the business exactly what to expect from a, a big scaling application that's rolling out. Uh, to these days, it can be easier to create a realistic production environment because if you're cloud native, if you're on the cloud and you're using, say, a container-based application, you can usually just spin up another environment that's like for like for a temporary period of time 
test against that, and then spin it back down with a lot less cost than it used to be where you'd actually have to have like physical servers or even a set of virtual machines that are always in place as always part as a one for one if you're going to do the testing right. But how many times have I been to an organization where they say, we have this production environment, but you're going to have to test in this testing environment or even worse, the development environment. And none of these environments, the staging environment, they're not nothing like production. And the problem I have with that is nobody's ever sat down and at least documented in any form or fashion what the real differences are. Nobody even knows sometimes. So if you're going to have an environment that let's say is 10% of production, document the 10%. Make sure you know that it's 10% and not 15.5%. And if there are certain things that have to be turned off, like you have to do some kind of mocking to some kind of a microservice or a back end, that you've documented that third-party call that had to be mocked, and you have a way to slow that down to match what you might see in production, because very fast, null, error type responses are very, very quick, and they can lead you to false uh, results of your test. So making sure that you have a good environment to do load testing in, however you get there, is pr of primary importance if you want to understand realistic results. Can you get some information from testing in another environment and understanding trends that might exist? Yes, but it's definitely uh, not going to find everything. And so when you don't practice uh, having a, a well-formed environment, Expect that things are going to slip through into production that you were not expecting under load and it's going to degrade performance or there's going to be resources being utilized at a rate that you did not expect and it's going to cause problems. So understand, environments are extremely important. Number three is being too developer centric. That could also mean being too focused on the CI, CD portion or too shifting left centric. And what do I mean by that? Lately, when I have conversations with clients, that initial conversation where I'm told, here's what we'd like for you to do for us. Now, many organizations are already doing some level of load testing, but they're still doing it sort of only the integrated, only right before they go to production. And they're trying to say, we, we want to bring this left, which is a great idea. But the whole focus is to bring all of the test into a CI CD pipeline so that when the developer creates something and rolls it out to the next stage down where uh, continuous integration takes over, that part of that is a performance test on the features, let's say a series of API calls, et cetera. Great idea. There's many valid, valid reasons for that. And fixing problems earlier in the software development lifecycle is always less expensive and a lot less hassle for everybody. However, that tends to start replacing this other testing that was done at the integrated stage. And that's a mistake. If you make 20 API calls and they all come back fast they, and all the performance requirements are being met by these individual API calls that are put together in the same series that would happen if you went through the web application using the GUI, that doesn't mean that when you roll it out to production, the end user is still going to have a good experience. And some of the things that are eliminated out of this are things like the network, uh, the last miles, uh, also maybe the CDN. And I've had people argue with me, Scott, we don't need to pull down static images. We don't need to worry about the CDN because that's all handled outside of our code. But what if the CDN is misconfigured and it's actually causing the application to slow down and you didn't test for it? in any of your testing because you were just focused on running it into a pipeline. So there needs to be a balance. Developers, I get it. You don't want the friction. You don't want testing to get in your way of rolling out code to production because nothing says money to the C-level than code that's in production and running. However, when customers want things right now, they want it right now, not just now. Part of that is Doing the testing, shifting left, you will find a lot of things that need to be fixed at this level. However, you need to have all of those other components involved and shift to the right as well and use observability as much as you can to also find those problems, not only in production, but in pre-production or testing staging environments as well. Find out what the resource usage is for one and for many as you go through this pipeline. You need both. Number two is weak analysis. 
Many of you who watch me on my presentations and on this show, whenever we're talking about load testing tools, you're probably tired of hearing me say this, but the value of any load testing tool is in the ability to give you good, actionable analysis and insights from the test results. And it's not just about how many users ran and what the timing of each thing or transaction was. It's also about the things that you monitor under load. The back-end infrastructure, like the database, the network, memory, CPU, disk, those things, as well as specific application-level metrics. And, and there's tons of metrics you can pull down. But it's being able to take all of that at the end of a test, culminate it together in one place, correlate the data, and turn those test results from just test results into an analysis or findings. If you're not good at creating analysis reports and finding reports that can translate not only to the, the technical people on the team, but the business people and be able to inform them, you have a problem and here's why this could be a showstopper or here's the business risk that's being taken by this, uh, by if you roll this out under these conditions and here's the data to prove it. If you don't understand how to take that data and turn it into a story, you're probably going to miss some amazing opportunities to fix applications before customers find problems. That's a big deal. And weak analysis is probably a 50% problem in the industry. I mean, half the people that I talk to or half the clients I go to, they're not monitoring either at all. They're just monitoring the basic things that come out of a, a whatever tool they're using, just the, the timings of how long the login took. But it doesn't necessarily tell you why it took so long. So you need to be able to pull all this other data and tell a story from, from what it's telling you. And remember that that test result data is only good for a short period of time. Its, it's value is only there as long as that system stays static. And developers are pushing changes all the time. Could be within an hour or a few minutes, more codes being pushed out. So you have to be able to get that and data and that analysis, put it together quickly and be able to formulate some kind of a plan on what you're going to do. It needs to be actionable data. And you don't want to monitor just everything for the sake of gathering because you can. You want to gather the stuff that, that you're going to be able to take action on. If not, it's just sort of a waste of time. It's just going to take you longer to create that kind of analysis and that that tell that story. So if you're going to focus on anything after you've learned how to use a load testing tool and you understand the load testing process is get very, very good at analysis. Study everything that you can about that. Take classes about it. Read articles on it and practice, practice, practice being able to look at those graphs and charts and data and correlate them together in such a way where you can say at this time, this number of users, this transaction, this resource, it's giving out. Here's the problem. And we can, we can show you exactly where the problem came from. That's what businesses want to know. And that's why they're doing load testing. Number one is no value. If you are not having a positive impact in, on, in your company, if you're not showing value in your role, you will either be replaced with somebody who can provide that value. Or if let's say the company is under some sort of regulatory compliance sort of thing where they still need this, they're going to figure out a way to spend the least amount of money on that. Whether it's on a person who really doesn't know what they're doing and pay them the least amount possible. If it's taking any tool that would be have a licensing fee and saying we're only going to go open source and we don't care if it doesn't provide you everything that you need. If it's just part of doing a checklist and that's what we're going to do is our checklist, that's what they'll do. Unfortunately, that's true. And businesses can decide to make the wrong decision and go out of business anytime they want to. So it's our job as performance engineers to be able to show our value. In order to do that, You've got to have those skill sets. You've got to be able to tell that story. You've got to be able to present the data in a way that makes business sense to the business. Part of that is, is just common sense. It's I have asked the question sometimes, why are you actually doing this load test? What is your actual uh, prime reason or your prime objective? Can't answer the question. I've looked at tests that have been created. I've looked at script, automated scripts that have been created, and I asked them, where did you come up with these processes? Did you ask the business? No, we just looked at some other sheet that somebody else had created in QA or somewhere. Have you ever actually went out to the business and sat with somebody at the business to see how they actually use your application and what they might be complaining about from the support center? No, we just do this thing for this checklist. What? 
that's where all these problems originate from. It's not having the, the common sense to say, why are we doing this? And start asking leading questions of people, not just yes or no. And being able to, to ask yourself, how can I provide the most value to my company and what we're trying to do with, with load testing this application specifically, to be able to show, are we going to hit a show stop? Is there a huge business risk in rolling this out? Um, is it, are there things that we need to address before we roll out this next version or end users are going to be harmed in some way or their experience is going to be bad? We're going to lose customers. I need to be able to tell that in a, in a way that makes sense to the business, which means follow the money, right? If you can prove to the business, let's say that you are in a, a shopping cart situation. If you can prove that you can remove X number of seconds from a shopping cart experience and that that would translate into a certain percentage uh, increase in conversions, which means real money. I guarantee you they'll start listening to you. So you've got to present it in those terms, not just in facts and figures and data points and charts and graphs, right? Figure out how you can provide the most value for your company. And if you do that, and the company still doesn't respect you enough and still doesn't have uh, any place any value on what you're doing, then you have to ask yourself inside, is that a place that I really want to work for? Or do I want to make an impact for somebody else? Because I know this, there are companies, new companies every day that need your help in making their applications perform better. There are millions of companies that are overspending in the cloud right now and all they need is optimized, more efficient software. And if you have the skills to do that and produce that and save them that kind of money, who would not want you around? Who would not value that? There's more companies that need that and would value that than those that don't. And those are the ones that I'm out there trying to help every day. And I'm sure you would want to do that too. That's my big five things that mess up companies when it comes to load testing. You got to have the right people, the right skills. You got to give them the right tools. You got to understand the, the right process. You, as a performance engineer, need to figure out how you can provide the most value. You got to have a good environment to test in. All these things are really, really important. So that doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're using an open source tool set that you've, you've put together multiple tools to get the kind of results. If you can tell the same story with that versus a commercial tool or whatever you're doing, that's important. So what do you think? Do you like this list? Do you disagree with this list? I'd like to know what you think. You can reach me on pretty much any social media platform out there, but if you scan that QR code or you go to the URL where it takes you, I'll show you all the places where you can find out where I'm at, what I'm doing. You can also just quickly send me an email to heyscott at smcjournal.com. And if you like this video, it would be great if you could like it and subscribe to the channel. I've got a lot of people who watch this channel who are not subscribed, but they still watch the show on a regular basis. But subscribing really, really helps me. And it tells me that I'm, I'm going in the right direction. And it tells me it's content that you want to see. So thank you so much for everybody who has subscribed to the channel, because we're getting on up there to, at this point, about 300,000 subscribers, which is great beyond my wildest dreams. I'm really appreciative of it. I uh, want to mention a couple of other things. I do have a mailing list. And if you sign up for our mailing list, every person on my mailing list every single month qualifies for a giveaway. We give away a big pile of swag stuff. And we're talking plushies and gift cards and all kinds of stuff, including my world famous 503 blend coffee, which if you haven't had before, then you probably haven't had really good coffee yet. So you need to try it. Everybody that has tried it really, really likes it. You can check out, there's a website on that as well, which you're probably already seeing. Thank you so much for everybody who is watching and I look forward to hearing from you and we will see you on the next SMC Journal Show. Bye-bye.